Okay, to uh, more serious matters, and tonight's guest speaker, Commander Steve Cole, PhD, BSc, CSM, REN. I first met Steve in 1995 when he was working as a lieutenant in Coonawarra in Darwin, doing stints as the port services manager, uh, sea time on board HMAS Ballack Papin and some diving work as part of an embryonic reserve dive team. We met up again in Canberra in 2001 when he came to work with me in Navy headquarters as a lieutenant commander, by now with a PhD under his belt, in the relatively newly established role as Navy's environmental manager. We worked together for the best part of 14 years, is my recollection, on a wide range of fascinating topics. I suppose I could say that I provided some policy brawn while he was the much smarter scientific brain in our small environmental team that punched well above its weight. He was promoted to commander and received a conspicuous service medal along the way, recognising his dogged determination to in pursuing and resolving some challenging environmental issues facing Navy during that time. Hopefully you've read the flyer which advertises this event and you can see the wide range of topics he has dealt with. I would make a point that environmental pressures and risks and compliance issues are very much part of the Navy seaworthiness um, system that reigns uh, supreme to this day. I'm sure he'll talk tonight about many of those topics that we talked about in the flyer, including the one that once attracted much public attention and media attention and can still pop up with no notice at all. The impact of Navy sonar on whales or what one of our colleagues described as charismatic megafauna. <laughs> so, Steve, I'd welcome you coming and talking to us about all those matters. Thank you. Thanks, Andy, for that introduction, and thank you for the warm welcome and the lovely dinner. Uh, yeah, Andy and I, I think it was 16 years, Andy. Was it? Oh, I think no. it was 16 years. Uh, not that I'm counting or anything. <laughs> One thing Andy and I always agreed on was um, the importance of supporting Navy capability and that everything we did over that 16 years was always attempting to be in the best interests of the Navy, dealing with some, at times, very challenging issues. Um, I will go back to the to the Space Force, though. If I had my time over again, I would really want to join the Space Force just so I could really be a space cadet. <laughs> <laughs> I have been called that. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the challenges we faced while we were working at Navy headquarters and how we resolved them. Um, so in that way, we're going to look at some historical examples of some of the problems that Navy has had to deal with over the years. And here is a really good encapsulation in four pictures of some of the things that we had to contend with. Some of you may remember the bow falling off the Kirky in Western Australia in 1991 during heavy seas. She was a 31-year-old Greek registered tanker. The bow fell off in relatively rough conditions and they ended up having to tow her up and scuttle her off the coast of northwest Western Australia. Those types of aged tanker problems continued and, and if you Google tanker accidents, you can see that they happened almost annually, spilling literally millions of tonnes of crude oil. The average age of a tanker, is, of a ship of that type, working life, is about 20 years. After 30 years, you can well imagine they're well beyond their prime. And, and uh, it culminated in... 2002, in what I think is a master of understatement, where the master of the Erica, this was off the coast of um, northern Spain, <coughs> radioed channel control with the, the comment, my ship is having some structural problems. <laughs> As a result of this, the International um, Maritime Organisation brought in controls to control the age of, of, of ships. And one of the first things they did was to say, we want all tankers to be double-hulled because that stops them when they run aground releasing oil. It, re it, it reduces the risk of these structural failures because the, the vessels are much stronger and it, it 
means that you don't have accidents where they run into wharves or tugs or other ships and you lose oil. And I realised early on that this had profound implications for the Royal Australian Navy. And I'll get into this a bit later, but the reality is that the Royal Australian Navy needs to go to commercial ports to get fuel. They don't, they don't bunker in their own ports, mostly. And so what that means is the, Ameri uh, the Americans and the Europeans basically banned single-hulled oil tankers starting in around 2007, 2000, it was 2011, it started, and they rolled it out. And what we realised was that HMAS West Australia was, as a very large tanker, was, was within that tranche to be paid off. As, and when she reached her retirement age of 30 years, um, well before that, we, had, we said that we need to make sure her replacement, which is subsequently serious, was a double-hulled oil tanker. And so she's in service now as a double-hulled oil tanker. At the same time, we were notifying the um, senior leadership that, hang on a minute... HMA's success is caught up in the second tranche in, in, in 2012, and we need to be thinking about what we're going to do about with her. And we talk about capability risks. If you want your ship to go to a commercial port, and every commercial ship is now double-hulled, if you're the manager of the port, of the, of the um, facility, uh, Caltex or whoever owns a refinery, the first thing you'd be doing is going to your insurer and saying, I want a premium reduction because all my tankers are double-hulled. And um, what, what eventuated was that HMO's success was coming up and the refinery in Brisbane declined to tender to provide her fuel. And the reason they gave was that they don't have insurance for single-hulled oil tankers anymore. And so HMO's success was, was scheduled for... Uh, double hulling. She went to Singapore for about eight weeks, ten weeks, and had her bottom cut out and had a double hull fitted. And that enabled her to sail for another ten years until she paid off, or eight years, I think it was, uh, un with her operations unimpeded. It cost $38 million, but it was priceless in terms of the capability because it meant that she didn't have to be replaced at the cost of half a billion dollars at that time. So that's a really good example. So I'm going to talk about why, why the Navy needs to worry about environmental management, some of the possible impacts on capability, of which we've mentioned one, and examples of some of the management issues that, that we've had to deal with, Andy and I. And uh, if we go firstly to the mission of the Defence Force, it talks very carefully about protecting and promoting the security of Australia and its people and its interests. And the protection and sustainable use of the environment is a significant interest of the people of Australia. One of the issues that the Australian Department of Defence has to grapple with is they are the largest government landholder and they own the largest fleet of ships in this country. And so as a result, they need to be seen as a trendsetter. They need to be setting an example for, for other operators. <clears throat> Many of the environmental issues that we dealt with over those years aren't really a significant environmental issue. I'll give you an example. The operation of the entire Australian Navy fleet at sea in one day probably produces less pollution than the, the, the uh, petrol and diesel cars in the city of Melbourne in the same day. It's not a really high level of, of environmental risk, but the public perception of the need for Navy to manage its environmental issues is much more significant. And so there is quite strong pressure on the Defence Force to be managing its environmental risks. And unfortunately, there are a few historic examples of poor environmental performance that has degraded confidence in, in, in the Defence Force. And one of the issues that Andy and I talked about many times was PFAS, which are a firefighting chemical, and you've probably seen that all over the news over the past few years. The issue of reputation management has come about... Everyone's got a phone these days with a, with a, with a camera on it. And so... 
I always used to talk to the incoming commanding officers and executive officers, and I used to say to them, you need to be aware that wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you are in the public eye. And here's a, here's a couple of examples. There's a trivial one and a serious one that, that we've had, we had to deal with. The top one was one of our old LP landing platform amphibious ships, and that was taken by a colleague of mine through a theodolite. They were ranging whales. And that's a picture of a humpback whale blow with the ship in the background. And, and he sent me an email with a photo and said, why, are you, why is the ship sailing down the coast amongst the migrating whales? In the, I must admit, we've just seen HMR Sydney come into port in, in uh, the US with a whale on its bow, so you understand the, the, the risk of collision is there. And I said, the first thing I did, with, having been involved in these studies, is, well, you had the theodolite, tell me how far away the whale is and how far away the ship is, because you can see that they're way out of scale, aren't they? I'm not sure if I'm getting a bit of feedback there, am I? Yeah. Is it OK? Yeah. Uh, the, so he wrote back and said, well, the whale was at three miles and the ship was at 12 miles. Yeah, and I said, well, thank you. You've just confirmed that the, that the ship's company are maintaining their, their vigilance for whales and staying more than one nautical mile distance for any whales visible on the surface. So that was a trivial one, easily answered. The second one, not so trivial, not so much more challenging. Marion Bay in November 2005, um, a, a, a pod of pilot whales, 150 pilot whales are on the beach in the foreground, those people in those atrocious sea conditions trying to rescue at the, the animals. You might be able to see, slightly left of centre and far right on the horizon, two Navy mine hunters searching for a lost anchor at the time. It, it was front page news around the country and resulted in Andy and I flying down for an for a <coughs> intergovernmental review of, of this incident because, uh, because of the close association in, in terms of timing. And, and the result was that the stranding had actually started before the ships left port, but you understand the, the, the uh, reputation risk associated with these things are very challenging to manage. But it was a good outcome for the Navy in terms of um, it turned out to be just bad timing that the animals regularly strand. In fact, that part of the beach is known as the boneyard because it's, it's a trap. Unfortunately, <laughs> the animals can get caught that way. There are other examples there we can talk about if we have time. The impacts on capability can be operational, financial, or they can cause impacts in terms of how training is conducted, the realism of training. I'll give you a, a case study the Massachusetts Military Reserve is a fairly small training area. It's probably only a bit larger than the central city of Melbourne. It was, has been used for decades by the US Marines for, for air-to-ground and surface-to-surface and, um, -surface gunnery and weapons training. It's a sandy substrate and use of fuel, oils, um, residues of ammunition and so forth resulted in contamination of the groundwater. The groundwater contamination, the groundwater was the sole source aquifer for the local town. It was the only way they got water. And so the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, suspended training in a military training area. It's the first time it's ever happened in the US. They, their, their training was suspended at the site in 1997 and they were ordered the, um, to commence remediation in, two, in the year 2000. The clean-up is suggested to cost $850 million and take 30 years. And so a big part of what I was about in Navy was stopping that type of expense, which means that Australia would lose one of its air warfare destroyers. That's the, that's the cost of these type of remediations. It was actually the first time in history that military activities were spended on environmental grounds, and it was a really good, um, a really good lesson on, on on how things could go awry. Operational um, impacts down the bottom in black. At any one time, there's at least ten navy ships doing environmental stuff at sea. 
And it's not something you generally think about, but you think about a patrol boat um, patrolling the northern part of Australia. Part of what they do is they're controlling Ill illegal fishing activities so that we, we know that our fisheries resources are being managed and that they're being, being uh, uh, preserved for Australian use. They're also out there looking for mosquito larvae. They're looking for um, livestock on board, all of these things, rats or, or, and other vermin, so that if those vessels come ashore in Australia, they may bring other pests and diseases. So these are activities that are going on on a daily basis. We have hydrographic survey ships that are out there doing survey to keep routes safe for ships so they don't run aground and we don't end up with further environmental damage. The, the need for environmental management um, is profound for issues such as access to commercial ports. I mentioned the double hulled and single hulled tankers as a good example. Access to marine reserves, making sure that the ships are fitted with the right types of pollution control equipment on board so that they can access the Great Barrier Reef unimpeded. And critically, non-compliance with international environmental standards might be used by a tool by a foreign country as a justification for excluding an Australian warship from within their EEZ, uh, Economic Exclusion Zone, or, or within their territorial sea. So, so the implications in terms of capability can be quite profound. Operational constraints. There are significant operational constraints if environmental management is not effective. One of the serious problems that we dealt with was the issue of ships accumulating biofouling. And you can see on the left there a picture of a clogged cooling pipe on an Anzac-class frigate. That ship left Western Australia, went to the Persian Gulf with a load of juvenile mussels in their cooling system, and it went to the Gulf Nice warm water, plenty of food, the mussels grew really big. And so you can imagine if your cooling system's not working very well because the pipes are clogged, a bit clogged, well, let's think about what the cooling system runs. The cooling system cools the main engines, it cools the gearboxes, it cools the combat system and other computer systems on board. Uh, and, and, so, and so having... Uh, biofouling within the ship's internal plumbing is a really serious capability risk. In the same way that if the hull is fouled, the ship will use more fuel, the propellers get fouled with barnacles and other growth, the, the ship uses more fuel. And, and a good example of that is if a submarine is heavily fouled, it needs more energy to, to push itself through the water which means it needs to come up to snort to recharge its batteries more often. And that's called an indiscretion ratio, is how often the submarine has to come near the surface to recharge its batteries. And so it, there are direct capability um, risks associated with that. Financial risks. I've already mentioned site remediation. I don't think we need to talk about that anymore. Removal of unexploded ordnance. This is a major issue around Australia. One of the issues that Andy and I dealt with significantly over the time was disposable obsolete ships developing policy and, and making sure that the, the methodology used was appropriate. And we worked quite closely with the engineers to develop changes to the construction standards of the ships around what type of sewage system is fitted, how, how are they going to manage garbage on board the ship, how, how, is, how is waste oil and other fluids, how is that all going to be managed as, as uh, requirements for management of wastes changed over time. And that, in many cases, required equipment redesign. Garbage was one of the biggest issues I had to deal with, and it's a really good example of how public perception changes over time. I've, I've always said that the people that are in the Navy at any one time are like a small version of the broader community's values within, within, within the Navy at any one time. And what happened was in 
uh, January 2013, they changed the international controls on disposal of garbage at sea to zero disposal. From previously, the only thing that was banned was plastics, but in January 2013, that changed, that changed to include paper, cardboard, glass, metal, all of those were banned from disposal at sea. And in the, we had about five years' notice, and I remember discussing that with Andy, and, we'll, and I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be a hard sell. People don't want waste on board ship. It's, it's smelly. It might be a um, health hazard. We need to manage all of those risks. But I started presenting this at the commanding officers and executive officers desig courses, and universally the response I got from people that were probably in their late 20s to late 30s sort of age group, universally they said, should have done this years ago. And I was all prepared to be stoned, or, or worse, <laughs> for, for suggesting that we've got to come up with solutions in this way. But, but the, what I hadn't realised was just how far social expectations have moved in only 10 years. And it actually resulted in some significant capability outcomes for Na Navy. One of them was that the Anzac-class ships were very close to their maximum weight limit. But, and they used to keep their uh, garbage stowed in the stern. But they had an open stern... Uh, the, with all the openings to allow the mooring lines. What they, what they realised was that if they enclosed the stern uh, and, and made it an enclosed space, they could have a, a proper garbage set up uh, to manage the garbage, but critically it gave them extra buoyancy, which meant that the ships weren't near to their maximum buoyancy weight. It allowed them to carry more sensors and weapons and and uh, stores on board. And so there was a significant capability outcome for that class of ship because the, the, and, and the driver was the need to be, have better management of the, of the wastes on board the ship. We've um, mentioned a little bit earlier about whales. Um, <coughs> Australia is home to three main species, the southern right, the humpback and the blue whales. If Navy doesn't manage its its, its interactions with whales to a, to a standard that is acceptable to the average Australian, we might get excluded from using training areas for times when the whales are there. That might be a possible outcome. Well, the problem is that humpback whales migrate through the West Australian exercise area in spring and autumn, southern right whales are there in winter, and the blue whales are there in summer. So if we can't find a solution that allows Navy operations to go ahead in the presence of whales with low risk to the animals, then the risk is that we may be, have very few windows to use the area the way we need to. Andy and I spent many years managing this, and I'm pleased to say that I, I, I think 15 years on that Navy's operations are pretty much unimpeded today. I think it's one of our greatest, greatest achievements was getting over that battle. Dumping at sea, it's probably not something in your mind, but if you think about illegal foreign fishing vessels that, that come into Australia, they represent a serious threat to our uh, biosecurity with rats and, and other vermin on board, and they have um, uh, often heavily fouled with species that might impact on our uh, aquaculture in Australia or even our, our, our environment. And so they're, they're, they're disposed of at sea, they're sunk at sea, mostly sunk at sea. And the problem that that brings about, if you just dump them anywhere, is that most of Australia's offshore area is trawled by fishing boats. And it's called broaching. If a fishing boat doesn't know there's something on the, on the sea floor and they're towing a net, They'll drive along like this and the net will snag and the boat will turn sideways and it'll, it'll turn over. And um, it, it's not happened from Navy vessels, but the, 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 this, this is an outcome that has occurred. People have died from trawlers broaching. 
And so the need to, is to make sure that the, the dumping of um, illegal fishing vessels and, and uh, other, other obsolete equipment is done in a way that's, that recognises that there's other people using the marine environment. Another example is if you, if you need to dispose of a foreign a illegal fishing boat, you don't want to dump it on Australia's main communication cable with Singapore or, or, any, or an offshore oil and gas pipeline. So there's a whole lot of other environmental users you need to consider, not other human users of the marine environment that need to be considered. Ship recycling was a was a very big part of our fo focus in the in those years. In the time Andy and I were at Navy headquarters, more than thirty ships went to the went to the breakers. Uh, Australian Navy ships. If you think Australian has has around fifty ships in the fleet, and they on average last twenty five years, that's two a year. But generally, what happens is it's not two a year. Yet you won't have any for a few years, and then it's ten. <laughs> so, so it's all over the place. But the reality is that there's a if you if you're ever interested in ship disposal, this is Alang Bay in Pakistan, and it's a really interesting uh, to to view how how they manage um, oh and s. It's a real eye opener <laughs> to see how. Yeah, I, yeah. So workers in thongs, no no protection equipment. Um, Oil and 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 uh, images of people sorting different types of asbestos into different grades with their hands. It's just horrifying, and so that that led to the. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it fell off. That led to an international convention on the safe and, and uh, disposal of, of ships, to which Australia is a signatory. It meant that defence had to comply and needed to comply, and so there are designated shipyards in the world that, are, that have the credentials to dispose of ships in an appropriate way. There was a case of a ship called the uh, Clemenceau. Uh, I don't know whether you know um, the French. She was a French aircraft carrier from the 1950s, uh, steam. Air, um, she was uh, probably a little bit larger, but similar to Melbourne. 800 tonnes of asbestos she had on board. It, and, and to give you an idea of just how um, awry the issue of management of environmental matters can go. And I remember having a discussion at the time with the senior leadership that we don't want to go down this path. The, um, the French Navy and the French government declared that the ship was still a warship uh, when she was being towed to uh, Pakistan for scrapping. And the um, European Union and various interested parties went to the uh, Euro European High Court and the European High Court ruled that a, that a ship that is no longer commissioned is, is a repository of hazardous waste. waste. It is no longer a warship. The ship was under tow to, uh, through the Mediterranean. The, the um, Egyptian government refused the entry into the uh, Suez Canal en route to India. So they rerouted her around the Cape of Good Hope and towed her to India and the Indian government refused entry permission. The, the President of France at the time personally intervened to bring the ship back to France to be disposed of properly. And so there's an example. I, I have no idea how much all that cost and how much reputation they lost. But it's a really good example of poor management that led to a very poor outcome. And, uh, and so I used that example with the senior leadership and said that we need to make sure that when the ships are scrapped, that they are done, it's done with a yard that is appropriately licensed for all the waste materials and, and that has appropriate <coughs> standards of oh &S for the workers. And that, that, those, those yards around the world, many yards have now been approved to, to, to do all, all of that appropriately. 
And as a result of that, um, all of the Australian warships have been, um, since, 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 those, since the early 2000s, have been either scrapped in Australia or sent to the US to be scrapped at one of the yards that's approved over there, towed, towed over. Uh, and and I, I feel that we have been somewhat responsible for development of that capacity in Australia because when not long after I joined, I had, had someone uh, come and talk to me and say, we've got a problem in Western Australia with a submarine called Orion. And Orion had been... She was the parts boat for the last of the... to keep the last of the Oberon class running in Australia. She was the parts boat that they ratted. And she was sitting at a mooring in, in, um, in uh, Coburn Sound. And she had everything. She had tributyl tin anti-fouling, peeling off. She had asbestos, you name it, everything. And she was falling apart, effectively. And... There was no option. She she was no. Lo they'd taken the batteries out, so this so the vessel was no longer seaworthy to tow in the open sea because she was top heavy. And so, I we found a a contractor called McMahon's in South Australia that had cleaned up the Whittenoon asbestos mine, and I rang him up and I said, "Do you reckon you could do a submarine?" <laughs> I said, we'll give it a go, and, and I put them on to then DMO, and uh, as a result, um, Orion was scrapped in the shipyard in Stirling at, at significant cost, but they got rid of a problem that had been there for 10 years, for which there was no solution. So it's, it, it was, a, it was a, one of those stories that led to a whole new industry that's in Australia now, and, and that company went on to to uh, scrap the Armadale class patrol, most of, not the, the Fremantle class patrol boats, uh, and amongst others, and so it's been a good outcome for Australian industry. I mentioned introduced marine species as a, a capability issue. That picture on the left is not a warship. That's actually a a um, a bulk carrier in in a dry dock in Singapore. And that's one of the inlets. They're called sea chests. They're the inlets for the cooling water for the main engines. That, that sea chest was so clogged with mussels mm -hmm. that it took three days to drain the water out of it. And, and you can sort of see, you can probably see the black, the black things are the, that are in, in between the grate there are all the mussels. And so mussels are a, a real problem. And, and I've always felt that if you had a clean cooling system, maybe it only needs to be about 10% of the size because it would actually work. Whereas if you let a cooling system get clogged like that, you need a really big one because, because it's not very efficient. So, so it's, it's a significant capability issue and a major line of research with our defence science people to find new solutions. Anti-fouling coatings. Um, this was a really interesting one. We worked on for quite a few years with Defence Science. You can see a p painted uh, Fremantle class patrol boat on uh, uh, Armadale class patrol boat on the right, and HMAS Shepparton with hockey hockey stick stripes on her on her hull. They're all different anti-fouling coatings. With the phase out of some of the more toxic anti-fouling paints, there was a loss of effectiveness. There was a paint called tri tributyl tin, which was fantastic anti-fouling. Killed everything. <laughs> Absolutely everything. It's really nasty stuff. And it was phased out uh, around the year 2000, and it was difficult to find replacement paints. And so there was an ex extensive program of research to identify solutions, to find new paint types. And to give you an idea of the effect, the the drag on the ship can more than double if the ship's heavily fouled. And so that means fuel, fuel consumption can easily double in the sh on the ship. And so having a clean hull uh, means that the ship maintains its speed and it maintains its performance in terms of endurance. And they're crucial capability issues. So, so finding uh, the correct type of anti-fouling paints was a major issue. One of the problems was most of the anti-fouling paints were developed by the US or the UK or within the EU in a water temperature of 3 to 8 degrees Celsius 
and not much sunlight for much of the year. Put the same anti-fouling paint on a ship and then moor it in Darwin with a water temperature of 30 degrees and plenty of food and sunlight all year round, and that the same anti-fouling paint can grow a reef. And so, so what it required was us to understand how the anti-fouling paints performed in the conditions that we were using them. So that was a major part of the work. We, we trialled uh, painting ships' propellers and they gave about a 5 to 10% increase in performance. Uh, in ter- and and if, if, that, if that pays off, 5 to 10%, you actually spend a lot of money to try to get something to go 10% further. Uh, it, it's a significant capability increase. So that was a really interesting project to work on as well. And I think that was an, an overview of what we did for 16 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I will credit Andy McKinnon with that photo on the, on the back there, uh, back, back there, which uh, was three classes of patrol boats. Yes, uh, um, it was really quite striking. The side-on image is probably a little better, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Because you can see that the Armadale is twice as long as the Arrow class, and the Fremantle sort of in the middle. And so you can see that the, the not not only length but also the bulk of the the vessel has just gone up exponentially in three generations. And of course, the Armadale sort of be replaced by the the new. Um, uh, Fuhrer class. Yes, the new Arrow Fuhrer class, which are... 80 metres. Yes, which are probably as big again. And they're steel. And they're steel, yeah. Mm-hmm. If we go back to that discussion we had about anti-fouling paint, one of the real problems we had was was that the majority of anti-fouling paints used today are copper, <coughs> are copper-based, um, that kill the bugs. The problem is you put a copper-based anti-fouling paint on an aluminium hull, it turns the hull into a battery and it'll dissolve before your eyes. So you can't actually use a, a copper-based anti-fouling on, a, on, a, um, on an Armadale-class patrol boat. And so it was a real problem trying to find it. And, and I don't think they ever satisfactorily addressed the problem of, of hull fouling, particularly as the ships were all based in Cairns and Darwin, where, of course, it's nice and warm and there's plenty of food for the bugs. But, the, yeah, the new class of ship will be steel. I'm sure that's not the only capability reason they went back to steel, probably to give the, the chippies some work with the, with the, with the, with the chipping out. Uh, but but it, uh, it's a good example. I think it's a really good example of how capability changes over time. Thank you. Is there any questions? Time, are they? Is that the story I've heard? I'm not sure it was. It, it was. It was a design feature of how yeah. how strong the hulls were and where they were reinforced. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, these the design, these yeah. ships are working in a seaway, and if yep. you haven't, if the structural elements <coughs> within the skin of the ship, if you like, are not uh, appropriately strong enough, then. Um, they will crack in yeah. places. I and mean, that's what they're doing. We had cracking in the Fremantles too. I, I yeah. remember we used to, I mean, going across the Pacific, uh, the front end and the back end would either want to sag or hog, mm-hmm. is the opposite. Mm-hmm. And so we'd get cracking across the back of the wheelhouse um, in the aluminium. Fremantles were a steel hull aluminium superstructure, uh, but you still get it, in, not, not in the hull, but in the upper works. I don't think they ever satisfactorily transferred the design from a civilian vessel to a military vessel because a military vessel like an Armadale class patrol boat there's a fishing boat sinking 200 miles offshore and it's rough they need to get there and they'll drive the ship hard to get there and I don't think they ever satisfactorily really looked at that as as the fact that no that the ship has to go <laughs> and it has to get there as quickly as possible and so it probably mean the ship needed to be heavier uh, heavier built yeah. to, to handle the, the, the type of use the military would use and, uh, uh, and it, it always interests me that there's a trade off if the vessel's heavier there's a trade off in performance they're a bit slower um, but but if, if, if the trade off means that you don't have 
hull problems like that, then maybe we should accept a one or two knot reduction in top speed because we know the ship will handle whatever we throw at it. And maybe that was part of the decision to go back to steel. Yeah, no, I don't know. Steve, you mentioned uh, that you might talk a little. Um... <coughs> I've lost my three. Somebody else. I'll come back to it. Going back about 30 years and, it, and in a different Navy, I remember that one particular system which was illegal uh, was allowed in ships because they were warships and that was a, uh, a halide fire smothering system. Mm. Are there any similar exclusions at present time? Oh, it's certainly, the, for example, the, the submarines um, use a halon suppression system and they have an exemption to use it. The problem is, of course, is they've had to stockpile halon because it's been banned now for more than 20 years. They've had to stockpile uh, halon to see through the life of the platform. So imagine the, the challenges. It's a bit like looking for an anti-fouling paint to paint the ship. You've got to look at what's commercially available because, because you're not going to go and pay some manufacturer to, build, to, to make you 100 tins of paint to, to paint Navy ships. We're, in a, uh, we're such a small fleet in this country. We've really got to look at amongst the commercial anti-fouling options because it's just not viable to try to produce something. And in the same way with Halon, Halon is now environmentally known to be environmentally so damaging that it's been banned. And, and, and I do know that the previous tanks we had and, and, and the, the current Collins-class submarines have exemptions to continue the use, but it creates all of these problems in you have now a situation where you become the owner of, of a stockpile of this material to see through the service line. But probably the worst is... Where are you going to find a tradie that's got a licence to work on Halon anymore? Because because no 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 commercial entity can use it, and and so they have no there's no licensing system for them to operate uh, on that that equipment. So it, if you if you go down the path of so, almost sole sourcing some chemical that's no longer in use in the commercial field it drives you down a, a completely unsustainable economic path in terms of um, through-life management of the fleet. It's the same as BCG, isn't it? Halon? Mm. Are they the same? Which that? BCG and Halon, are they the I same? I don't know what BCG oh, is. Sorry. Yellow extinguishers that used to be everywhere. Oh, BCF, yeah, you mean? Oh, BCF. Yes, well, yes. BCF, I beg your pardon. Yeah. yeah. Same thing? Yeah, yeah, they're... they're um, they damage the, the no, they're known, and, and the evidence is quite clear that they damage the damage the ozone layer. Oh. Yeah, and they're quite so quite very significant. They're also a very significant greenhouse gas, but uh, problem. But the, the main problem is damaging the ozone layer because they're very long-lived chemicals in the upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And since that ban has come in place and it's been phased out, the the, the quantity of of of, of halons in the atmosphere, have the, uh, they've been measuring the decline. So it, it has had a positive outcome by banning them. Yeah. Steve, I remember it now. Could you talk a little about the um, alternative fuels process that you were involved in and quite where we are at now yeah. in, in Navy or indeed Australian options? Oh, sure. <laughs> I. I culled a few things because I was a bit worried I was going to go on, uh, rabbit on for too long. But um, alternative fuels is, is my passion. It's something I've been interested in for about 30 years. And I'll tell you why. Um, we have known for many years that there is a finite resource, in t even before we go down the path of CO2 emissions and climate change, we know that fi it's a finite resource that... that, that um, uh, that uh, petrol and diesel is a finite resource. And so the problem that I've had for some decades is that, um, and if we take it in the present day context, is that we're building a new class of 12 submarines. The first of those submarines will be built next decade. The last of those submarines will be built in the 2050s. 
it will see service till the 2080s. And I, I, I won't be around then, but I can guarantee you that you will not be able to buy petrol and diesel in 2080. I, I, that, that is an absolute fact. And so the capability problem for defence is that all of the platforms that are currently being procured or in service need to use something that looks and smells like diesel. But it probably won't come from ground-up dinosaurs. <coughs> It'll come from another source. And so my interest um, was peaked when I had a discussion with the uh, Pacific Fleet, US Pacific Fleet Environment Manager, because they were, this was around 2008, 9 they were talking about something called the Great Green Fleet. And um, none of us are old enough to remember, but in the early, uh, very early part of last century, they had a Great White Fleet that sailed, um, sailed the Pacific to declare here is, here is America. Strangely enough, that's sort of what China's doing at the moment. <laughs> the Americans can f forget that bit. Uh, so, so they had the Great White Fleet uh, to show the flag. Well, what they decided was that they wanted to sail a carrier strike group at sea using alternative fuels. And that included nuclear for the carrier, but it meant that they wanted to use alternative fuel blends for the aircraft on the, on the, on the flight deck of the carrier and for all of the support ships that operate with it. So, so the, submarine and the, and the submarines and the, and the carrier, when they're in the strike group, are all nuclear, of course, in, in their context, but all the other platforms. And the aim was in 2012, uh, the Rim of the Pacific exercise, RIMPAC 2012, was to, was to fly the, um, the airframes. So they were going to fly the jets and the helicopters that were going to use the 50% alternative fuel blend. And then in 2016, they would amass enough alternative fuel that they could run the carrier strike group on the alternative fuel for the duration of the two-week exercise. And, and so I, I thought, hey, this is really forward thinking. They need to be thinking about these things. It's not a problem that's going to go away. And, uh, um, it, and so I assisted our defence science people to review and get the information from the US Navy because you can well imagine the, the certification process that needs to be gone through if you're going to use a fuel always in the back of my mind was, they're running on ground-up dinosaurs, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just a fuel, it's a blend of, of stuff. So we just need a fuel that meets the specification. And so the Americans have gone through a certification process and I worked with the Australian authorities. Um, you, you all know how complex defence is. So you've got defence science, the boffins have got to look at the data. And then you've got um, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers that, um, that make the Rolls-Royce gas turbine or the um, Pratt & Whitney gas turbine that's in the warship or the aircraft. And then you've got Boeing or, or someone that made the airframe. They've all got to have their say about whether the, whether the, um, whether the fuel is suitable for their, for their equipment. And I always the example I used to give was... Um, everything might be good, but what about that little solenoid valve? Has someone thought about that little solenoid valve in the system? And that's why the OEM for the airframe is involved, because there's a little solenoid valve that the pilot turns on and off when he wants to transfer fuel between tanks. Is that OK with the, with the alternative fuel blend? So we went through that certification process. Then it goes to the Joint Fuels Organisation in, in Defence that... that after they do their review of everyone else's review, they go, this fuel is cleared to be used by um, defence platforms. Ah, yeah, but they actually don't own the platforms. The platforms are owned by a capability manager, uh, like, like the... Uh, 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 the Navy. Well, yeah, the cap he, he, he ultimately is, but each of the Fed commanders is the... Yeah is the platform owner. And the platform owner will look across to DMO, or what we now call CASG, to the systems program office, the SPO, for the advice. And so the SPO's got to approve it uh, as the capability 
uh, manager, through life manager, and then it's got to go to the capability owner, which is Chief of Navy's delegate, to give the final tick-off. And so for a, 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 a helicopter, the final tick-off will be Comfar in Nara as the commander of the fleet air arm. And so it was a very complicated process that took us probably nearly four years to get to the point, but it was just really great that... Um, that the then maritime commander was um, Tim Barrett, later Chief of Navy. When he was um, maritime commander, he was on board Nimitz with the Secretary of the US Navy, and they signed the Statement of Cooperation on Alternative Fuels that Andy and I drafted, and that was, that was pretty cool. And, and uh, um, that led to two of our Seahawk helicopters flying in 2012, and then in 2016, we certified two frigates and the, hel uh, the helicopters flew again on the, on the blended fuel. So the ships participated in that Great Green Fleet uh, evolution, which was, yeah, really, really quite uh, pleasing. And interestingly enough, I'm about to start two days a week back with joint fuels to reinvigorate the alternative fuels program. Um, and it sort of reminds me that, of just how far ahead we were thinking in nearly 15 years ago that we were thinking about these things that, that's now become a major um, interest of the senior leadership because they've looked at the tea leaves and said the same thing. We've got joint strike fighters that will operate into the 2050s. We've got um, air warfare destroyers and Hobart class and we've got the LHDs that are going to operate at least that long and we've got submarines that will be operating 30 years after that. And so we've got to have a backup plan in case we just can't get diesel anymore. So what was the answer? Was it olive oil and fish, or fish <laughs> from the, you know, the fish and chip shop? Or That's a that? really good question because, <laughs> because the fish and chip shop oil is what you call biodiesel. Yeah. That is not what we're talking no. about. What we're talking about is test tube manufactured fuels synthetic. synthetic fuels is a really good description they're really high end high quality products at this stage expensive but um, with all of these things as they build capability the cost will come down so, so it's not at all like the biodiesel when you see people saying they put fish and chip oil in their old land cruiser or something no it, that would never happen there's an international uh, regulatory organisation called ASTM. All of the original equipment manufacturers are part of the ASTM process. And Dr David Evans at DST here in Melbourne, at Fisherman's Bend, is on the ASTM panel for Australia. And they approve pathways. So currently there's seven approved pathways for, for um, these fuels and they're the only fuels that can be used. So they're approved by ASTM, and those pathways have been approved by the US military, but only two of those pathways have been approved, by, approved through the Australian system. So, um, no, that it will be very restricted. Unless ASTM has certified them, which means that Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, um, Rolls-Royce, all of those... Uh, organisations have approved that uh, product for use, it will never even be considered. Uh, 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 it must go through that process. That process costs between 10 and $20 million, that approvals process costs about that much. But they're going to be... Uh, uh, synthetic have to have a base of organic fuel, of organic yes. compound, so it's, yes. it's going to come from something which is yes. similar to... Oil or yes, oil yes. Gas. So for aircraft, the most commonly used one is alcohol to jet, okay. which wins me over. <laughs> um, alcohol to jet basically uses sugar cane products, um, so you can yeah. use sugar, yeah. fermented sugar, but more likely they will use the fermented biomass that's left over. It's called bagasse, which yeah. is the waste from the sugar cane. Sure. And uh, my view is that Australia, our military uses a couple of megalitres a year of fuel, that's actually a really nice-sized biofuels plant, alternative fuels plant, up in North Queensland, could actually produce all of Australia's um, aviation fuel for our, um, 
for our uh, frontline aircraft. And what a great capability outcome for Australia if we're producing our own fuel when at the moment they import F-44, the fuel that we use at sea for um, our uh, helicopters, is imported from South Korea through the South China Sea. I'm sort of looking at that and going, where's the capability value there in, in having that risk? So, so this is all really being driven about sh ensuring the capability can continue to be used throughout service life. It's never going to be viable to re-engine um, these platforms in the same way you have to look back 100 years to when the British Navy transitioned from coal to oil. There was a big... Uh, 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 the senior admiral uh, engineer in the British Navy did a review of coal versus oil in the er very early 1900s and he spent two years putting this review together, toured the Commonwealth, great job if you can get it, and at that time his report said stick with coal because um, oil's really hard to get hold of, it's not available in all our colonies, it's an unknown fuel, we, we know how to handle coal, we're used to it, we understand the, how it works with our equipment, stick with coal. Within a decade, the entire British fleet was running on oil. That's how quickly that transition occurred. But we, we're not going to do that right in this case. I, I can't see that we're going to be in the situation where we'll build 12 new submarines and then pay them all off 20 years early because we, we can't you, you find a fuel for them or we can't transition them. Well, well, we're going to pay whatever it costs to get a fuel that will work with them if we have to. And so... It's much more about sustaining the capability through life than concerns about the environmental management. Going back to that earlier comment I made that, 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 that the entire Australian fleet produces less emissions in a day than the cars on the streets in Melbourne and in the same day. And so, so in terms of scale, it's not very much, but the capability risk is can you still buy the product in 50 years' time? which is what we're talking. We're talking more than 50 yeah. years away that, that, that those ships will still be operating. Very interesting. Yeah. Steve, was that, an, was that answer your question enough? Yeah, more than that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I was going to say there's one more I have. And, um, it's not really a, a naval or maritime issue, although some of it occurred in the marine environment, but the uh, business of cleaning up chemical weapons um, around Australia particularly, I know... Defences had to get involved in that, I'm, and I've no idea quite where it's all at now. Is it? Yeah, is that program it, complete, or it it gets dredged up from time to time, if pardon the pun, by the media. Mm -hmm. um, there is around about fifty or sixty thousand tonnes of chemical weapons dumped off the <coughs> coast of Australia, off um, mostly off Brisbane, Sydney, and King I west of King Island in in Tasmania. All world, ex World War Two, uh, post World War Two dumps, uh, mostly, mostly uh, dumps that were set up because the stores were on shore in Australia, in case, in case the enemy decided they were going to start using chemical weapons, and they were never used in anger. Anger. When I say fifty thousand tons, it sounds a lot, but that's the weight of the containers and the warheads, and 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 as you well know, the 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 actual chemical that's in them is a small percentage of the weight. But to put it into context, there's 2 million tonnes in the North Sea. Mm. So it is a, a significant problem. In Australia, the dumps are all in deep water, beyond 1,000 metres, very low water temperatures. The vast majority of the, of the, of the material is mustard gas. <coughs> uh, probably more than 90%, 95% is mustard gas. Mustard gas is a solid at the temperatures. It's also not very soluble in water. And so um, my advice has always been just leave it where it is. If you try to disturb it, you risk breaking it up and, and you get a very rapid pollution. Um, we also, after 70 years, <coughs> cannot recognise the container. We, we won't know... We'll, what is in it because you can't read a label anymore or, or, or it's just rusted away. And so the containers are compromised in structural integrity. We don't know what's in them. 
and moving them is is likely to set off a, a, a significant release. Whereas if you let them lie in state, then um, the process of gradual solution as the containers get a bit compromised is probably the most sensible outcome. I, I, I just look at the risk assessment of trying to move the stuff and deal with it as just unbelievable. I, I, I can't imagine people being happy with uh, them bringing ashore uh, the, the stuff from off King Island into, into um, here into uh, Port Phillip Bay to the to the jetty, the ammunition yeah, Port Wilson. in Port, Port Wilson, and, and and taking it ashore for disposal. I just sort of think, why would you bring mustard gas and 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 other chemical weapons, nerve gases? Why why would you even consider that? It's far safer to leave it where it is. But that's my that's my professional view as a marine biologist. I think it's better off left where it is because a catastrophic release. Um, is probably going to have far more serious implications. It's probably a bit different in the North Sea. Some areas there, it's quite shallow. They're talking 50 to 100 metres of water, and so there might be a real risk there. And but but even then, I think you'd you'd have you'd need an overwhelming case to touch the stuff to to have all of those risks and to manage all those risks. I, I just so so yeah, it does get dredged up from time to time, literally sometimes in trawl nets. Um, but, but my view is that it's best left where it is. So just quickly, with the uh, crystallisation of uh, aluminium um, compared to metal, as far as life goes, and uh, the um, results in the fault of war of aluminium, um, is, there, is there much sense in using aluminium on board a ship that's actually <coughs> burning itself or falls alongside a wharf or another ship that's burning, is that factor taken into the design of these, uh, the modern ships, to the metal advantage of, of fire? I, I'm, I, I'm not an engineer, but I'm absolutely certain that that was part of the decision. Yeah. Um, you've got to remember that the Armadale-class patrol boat was never designed to be a frontline warship. Mm. It, it was Its role was surveillance and interdiction patrol. Okay. It was not... Okay ever going to go to the Gulf or, or South China Sea or somewhere like that. And um, um, even in East Timor, there was um, the, the patrol boats didn't go to, when we were up in Darwin, uh, the patrol boats didn't go to East Timor. They were all doing their bit on on our side of the turf because they're just, yeah, for all of those reasons. And, and the FFGs, the Adelaide class, they, they were aluminium superstructure. And, and so it seems quite reasonable to me to go back to steel because it works. And if something hits it, it's not going to catch fire. Yeah, and, 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 and the uh, robustness of the ship would have been summoned in the name of those six Adelaide class. All were built in the US, and it was known that the two that were built here were much better quality mm. than US ones, so mm. you wouldn't send the US built ones mm. down into the Southern Ocean, preferably because the ones they built here are much stronger. They, they're, they're actually quite interesting. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a cross-section of the, the superstructure on the, on the uh, Adelaide class, and it's, it, it really looks like a piece of thick cardboard. It's got a really thin layer of aluminium on each side, and in the middle it's like this honeycomb, honeycomb of, of, of aluminium and light, light as a feather. And thought they... You, you look like you could, if you fell over, you'd put your elbow through it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cracks in it. <clears throat> More questions? Steve, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I, I think you uh, certainly fulfilled the expectations that I created for our, for our, um, our uh, chapter about how much and how broad the issues were that, that you dealt with. Um, Interestingly, to draw comparisons with the... Uh, talking about the Armadale class there, I'm very mindful of the fact the Armadale class is about the same size as the old Bathurst class minesweeper. Your father, I believe, served on one of those. Yeah, he um, commissioned Bathurst. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Steve's naval credentials go back even further than, than I portrayed. But thank you. I think that was a very informative and... Uh, an interesting presentation. I, I, I hoped and I think you fulfilled 
uh, my expectation that it, we don't give much thought to Navy's environmental responsibilities and, and issues from day to day, but you've given us a fair good glimpse into uh, the challenges that, that were faced in the past, but many of which still exist. Uh, they're ongoing issues. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to uh, thank you for your very kind uh, time here today. And, and speaking of Bathurst class minesweepers, there's a book that might interest you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.